Good afternoon, and welcome to the Center Stage Seminar Series event. My name is Tiffany Willoughby, Research Education Programs and Outreach Manager in the Office of Research at the University of Texas at Dallas. I will be your moderator. Joining me today is Dr. Howard Dover. Dr. Howard Dover is the Director of the Center for Professional Sales, Clinical Professor of Marketing and Sales Coach at the University of Texas at Dallas. As the director of the center, he consults with the center's partners to develop modern sales strategy to attract the top sales talent from the rising generation now entering the business world. His areas of expertise include digital disruption of the sales and marketing field, sales enablement, social selling, and sales effectiveness strategies. He has been a keynote speaker at Sales Enablement Experience 2017 AA-ISP Digital Sales World Sales 3.0 CSO Summit is the resident technology expert from Sales Educators Academy and has been an invited speaker at numerous sales, sales educator, and marketing conferences. He contributed a chapter to the book Standing O and was featured with his UT Dallas students in the documentary film, The Story of Sales. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dover as he takes center stage in the spotlight. Dr. Dover, welcome. Thank you for the introduction, Tiffany, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to let the campus community know a little bit about the sales program on campus. I often joke with people that um, we all know that we have um, one of the most winning chess programs in the world, and we have one of the most winning chess programs in the country, but probably most people at UTD don't know that we have one of the most winning sales programs in the country as well. Currently, um, the UTD program is, is currently the reigning World Cup champions of sales. And we just came off that a year ago prior to all the, the COVID excitement. And, um, and so we will find out whether we get to repeat here in about three weeks, where we either get to keep the crown or give it to somebody else. But we have a long history of, uh, of being a nationally recognized sales center. And so the hope of this broadcast is to maybe give a little bit of context to the UT Dallas uh, internal community around what, is, what does that mean? And so I think the first thing to help everybody understand is that we have a world-class, nationally recognized sales curriculum. Um, people from all over the world and um, from all over the United States often will affiliate education in sales with the UT Dallas brand. And so it is not uncommon for us to be tagged in all types of social media uh, as one of, the, one of the few institutions that actually have a professional sales program. What's interesting is there's over 60 to 220 different sales programs around the country. However, we tend to be one of the ones that everybody cites in the social media space. Several reasons for that are probably related to the fact that um, we were in the documentary film. And so we get a lot of people understanding that Salesforce came to UT Dallas about two and a half years ago and shot um, one of the chapters of the documentary film, The Story of Sales. And probably another reason is that um, our faculty, including me, uh, do significant external speaking engagements. So I, I probably um, conference presentations, both academic and industry are between 12 and 17 different presentations a year. And so we tend to be known not only in the academic space, but more aggressively in the um, the in, in the Fortune 500 and in the sales community space. So I wanna bring you backwards a little bit and say, how did this all start? So in 2012, 2011, 
UT Dallas contacted me. I'm actually a PhD from UT Dallas in the marketing area. And I was uh, pre-tenure, but about to get tenure at my other institution, at which time the marketing department, the area coordinator at the time called me up and said, um, did you know that 82% of all graduates from marketing programs end up in a sales job? And I actually indicated, I said, yes, actually, that's a national statistic. And he said, well, did you know we don't have anybody to teach that here at UT Dallas? And I said, well, I, I am aware of that because UT Dallas's business school is known as a quantitative school and our marketing department is pure quantitative methodology. So we have um, we have both Bayesian st statisticians, fundamental statis statisticians, and we have a lot of game theorists. So we are very quantitatively uh, um, known worldwide for our research in quantitative methodologies. So naturally, we would start a sales program. And so that was that was kind of an interesting conversation. And so about eight years ago, this is my ninth year at UT Dallas as a as faculty, I was brought in to begin teaching sales at the University of Texas at Dallas to bridge that gap. But I was also aware of our unique branding and our unique quantitative approach in the marketing department. Um, for the first year, I, I did go around and talk to all of the companies in the Dallas Metroplex. And I talked to IBM and I talked to, uh, back then it was McAfee, and I talked to some other companies and said, all right, you currently work with other universities like Baylor, uh, University of Houston, Florida State, and you know what sales programs are, but we're UT Dallas, we're gonna have to do it in our own way. What would you like to see us do? And for one year, I, I kind of did a, a, a road show around the different companies that would meet with me and I, I assembled what they thought we could do. And what there was is an opening to teach students to be technologically aware and analytically capable and yet be in complex selling environments. And so we began a journey of developing students in that space, we had um, companies like Oracle, Samsung, and um, and Ericsson, and Intel that all were early board members. And very, very early on, the curriculum got shaped to a forward-leaning curriculum. And it, in the first four to five years, our primary objective as a center was to um, develop the curriculum, but more importantly, also to connect the industry people to both create the curriculum and engage in a living, breathing curriculum. And so we actually hold now, if we fast forward just for a second, we're, we're nine years into that journey. We now hold seven major events every semester. I'm sorry, every year. And the biggest of those, there's two each semester that are really quite large. One of them we call Rookie Preview. And any student from anywhere in UT Dallas that's an undergrad can choose to take the course Marketing 3330, which is Introduction to Sales. The optional final of that class is to do a sales role play in one of our lab facilities in JSON with an actual industry buyer. And that actual industry buyer could hire them on the spot. But it, we then telecast that room. We have an interview room in which the meeting happens that there's a there's a live telecast within JSON to a room with between eight and 20 judges from industry that judge them on 25 dimensions of skill. At the end of that day, we have a, we in a non-COVID world, <laughs> we have a we have a banquet usually uh, now that we have the DJC, the Alumni Center, we do it at the Alumni Center. If not, we rent a hotel and we have a, a gala style event with between anywhere from 150 to 300 people. And we celebrate the, the top performances of the program. And students get jobs and develop networking through these opportunities. 
That's one of the biggest events that we do. It's one of the largest events that brings employers onto campus outside of a career fair. Many of these companies then choose to actually recruit through the other programs of JSOM and the rest of UTD. As we bring more and more companies onto campus, we usually make sure we make introductions to the Career Management Center at the Jindal School of Business and the Career Management Center at UT Dallas. This has been one of the major reasons why the, the, the Career Management Center at JSOM has continued to raise in national rankings because more and more flagship companies have contacted our center to begin recruiting on campus because they wanted the sales students, but they have now begun a campus-wide recruitment initiative. Companies like IBM, where we are now a target school. Four years ago, we couldn't get them to even talk to us, but now we're a targeted university for IBM. Adobe, within the last two years, Adobe has become a major partner. In this process, as we started talking with more and more companies, our advisory board moved away from advising us on curriculum to a board that began to tell us of the serious problems that industry is facing at, in a growing and living sales and marketing environment. And so we've taken on initiatives like we've hosted the, the Global Sales Enablement Society's first conference three to four years ago. And that was a gathering worldwide of people on campus with a society that had just formed but didn't have the ability to hold a conference. So we held their very first conference on our campus. So now we move forward, we do sales leadership summits for the external community two times a year. Every November, we hold a leadership summit for executive leaders in sales who are preparing for their go-to-market strategy in the new year. It's usually held in, in industry speak in Q4. It's usually held somewhere around November, the early part of November. So executives can come on campus and collaborate with each other as they're in their planning cycles. This is called the Sales Leadership Summit. This one's being held on November 6th. We then invite some of our partners and or other companies who have had phenomenal experiences or unique experiences in business continuity planning or go-to-market strategies. This year on November 6th, our kickoff speaker will be the Marketing Communications Global Director for Zoom, and he will describe the Zoom boom. How did they go from where they were to seven to eight hundred percent growth, and what was it like behind the scenes? Um, so he will be our kickoff speaker to end the day. We will have Salesforce.com that just came off a five billion dollar quarter, and when they announced that, their stock went up twenty five percent. And they will be bringing their evangelist, who is Tiffany Bova, who's worldwide known who will be speaking to us about not only the Salesforce success of the $5 billion quarter, but also they do research on the state of sales. We'll also be having the CEO, or I'm sorry, the CRO of a conversation platform out of Silicon Valley that has literally is listening in with AI bots on, on millions of phone calls a year, or a year and has intelligence gathered on what were people talking about through COVID, what kind of conversations were changed. So we'll get a briefing from them. And then also AT&T did a nationwide pivot. They used to have all people in the field and they had to move from field to virtual sales overnight. The person who, the VP in charge of strategic realignment of AT&T across the whole United States will be discussing a living, breathing transition of AT&T from door to door and, and, and what we call field sales into virtual and omni-channel. This is pretty common for our summits. We do this for our partners uh, that work with us and we do it for our students and we do it for our alumni. And then we shift our curriculum based off of the things we hear from our summits. So that's just kind of a little bit about what we do in the center. 
Why do companies partner with us? I think there's there's probably two main reasons a company would actually engage with the Center for Professional Sales at UT Dallas. 90% of our inbound requests are coming because they want to hire our students. We get about two to 300 phone calls a year from companies trying to hire the students that are being trained at UT Dallas. Now we produce about 60 to 80 certified students a year. It's a very elite program. And so you can see that we have an amazing number of people who want to hire a very short group of students that um, usually get multiple offers. We run 100% placement most years. In the COVID year, we hit a 95% placement rate. We did not lose most of our offers. Very few were rescinded. Um, we tend to work with great companies. The second reason that a company would engage with the Center for Professional Sales is around our our national reputation for our summits and some of the work that I've been doing around sales enablement and digital disruption. And so I, I, I tend, they tend to want to be involved with and hire students and have discussions with people who are talking about the way in which the field is moving and how quickly it's moving. Um, as you can imagine, our curriculum is, uh, is definitely influenced by the industry partnerships. It is a living, breathing curriculum. It's constantly updated by the advisory board and through alumni feedback, we wait a year until the students have been in the field and then we ask for open feedback on curriculum modifications. Um, some highlights over the last year or two, we've been under a major revision of the curriculum. It was a wholesale change that started three years ago. Due to the shift from having primarily millennials in the classroom to having the Generation Z in the classroom. We are a highly experiential model, so our students are not taking tests, but they're doing projects and engaging with the business community. We began to realize about three years ago that we were experiencing a high degree of disengagement in our key performance indicators. Uh, unlike many of us in the academic realm, we may use learning goals and learning outcomes. We actually have key performance indicators like the field has, and we can measure the engagement of our students through their engagement with platforms like Salesforce, LinkedIn, and other platforms that we allow them to use through partnerships with these companies. So we were beginning to experience a disengagement. That disengagement started at a 30% disengagement and within 18 months moved to 70% disengagement on KPIs. When we sat down and looked at it, we realized that the model we had was millennial driven instead of Z driven. So for the last two to three years, we have been bringing the curriculum in for a complete redesign to look for deeper engagement and bring back the, the value of the KPIs that we're looking at. In KPIs, I think the academic speak with that for that would be learning outcomes via assessments. Our assessments are live to the field and we're literally tracking the performance of our individual sales students the way an industry would their own salespeople. So we can track most of what we do as an individualized educational model with competencies achieved throughout a semester versus tests. So it's a very, very living and breathing curriculum. Um, so I, I've actually gone in over the last two and a half years, I've been working on our boot camp process and our digital prospecting model. I will admit that the COVID um, space has given us a huge monkey wrench and I don't think we, I, I think what we had is no longer um, providing what we want, but I think maybe all of us are in that same spot. Um, but one of the things we did find is our, we were seeing our industry friends were beginning to indicate with the modern technology evolution that's happened and the new skill and methods to going to market, 
we were uncovering three to five years ago certain companies that were increasing their effectiveness and their efficiency in the ratios of 800 to 1000 percent so i've been on a journey to interview those people and it's been an area we've studied this is where sales enablement is coming in it's one of the interests of our center and watching and helping to incubate the concept of sales enablement on a global scale and really trying to say can we bring those concepts into the classroom and can we incubate those concepts within our partner set to make that more commonplace and, and develop greater efficiencies in the marketplace um, for the first few years, we saw some exponential growth of maybe 80% to 100% in key performance indicators. However, what's been interesting is that our students have begun, once they get into the field as alumni, they have begun becoming record-setting performers in the field. For a few examples, um, one of our students who works at IBM actually achieved 800% of her quota in the last year. That's not normal for IBM, in case you're wondering. It is normal for us. Global sales school at IBM has top guns, which is the top 10% of their global sales school. UTD has consistently produced 10% of the top guns in, in most classes of global sales school. In fact, within the IBM structure, they have a name for them in Global Sales School. They call them UTDers because they identify the students as, as light years ahead of their peers. And so they immediately identify them as, oh, you came out of that program where you already know what to do. So that's normal for us, but the performance indicators of seeing a 700 percent helps us realize that maybe we have caught on to some of the things we've learned from Microsoft and their exercises and some of the places like the Sacramento Kings that have also experienced exponential growth. One of our alumni is the was the rookie of the year for Adobe and ne the next year, this last year, he was the number one performer in all of North America for Adobe within his category he was substantially higher than the next person. Qualtrics, the number one person in his field in all of North America was our student. He was 200% higher than the next best student. When I interviewed him, he was at 10 times the performance of his peers. So we believe we have maybe began to identify and then codify and even educate students in modern concepts. And so these are the things we look at at UTD. These are the things we're trying to learn. And then as we learn them, we are learning in an iterative fashion with our students. Our field is in a constant state of flux due to technological innovation. And so we are using our ability to collaborate with our students, our unique opportunity to have many technology components available to us, our unique curriculum actually has our students actually selling while they're in a class. They actually sell UTD and they actually sell engagements and partnerships with JSOM and UTD and the leadership summits and the other activities and events we do. This is done so that they actually have an actual experiential opportunity to do the work, but yet also be able to stop and learn in the process, unlike most jobs where they have to keep on doing the work, but they cannot stop and learn how to iterate and maybe get better. So those are kind of the highlights. I will tell you that we are known from other academic institutions as one of the top sales programs in competitions. We most 90% I'd say of the time we go on the road, we rank in the top 10 in the country. Um, and we, we pick our competitions carefully. We don't do every single one. We have amazing students, as we all know, we have an eclectic and beautiful group of students. 
who are very hardworking and are willing to learn things that many of our colleagues just don't get the experience of doing at other universities. Um, it, it really is it is really telling that we don't have a football program, but we can talk some smack in chess. So that really tells the story of UTD. We're glad to be part of that. And if you look in the tech sector, um, probably UTD is at the top of everybody's minds when it comes to where do you find talent that can sell extremely complex products, including most of the new technology but also complex manufacturing and consulting. And so this has been a fun ride and we are continuing to look into the future and try to expand what it is we can do to service not just the students at UTD, but maybe define in 2020 beyond, maybe redefine who we say our student really is. And maybe it's the actual sales and business community. And we're looking at programs in the next decade to service the global sales community in ways that we are currently with our students. So I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions or discussion points that people would like to bring up. Thank you very much, Dr. Dover. We do have questions in the queue for, for you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the first one is, can you tell us a little more about your boot camp you mentioned? So we call it boot camp, which is not fair to the military. Um, so we respect them, but um, there are people who have been through the military and been through that class, and they said that's harder than boot camp. I'm sure it isn't. I'm sure it isn't. Um, but the psychological effect is probably similar. We call it, it's our advanced class. So our advanced class is is the quota carrying class with it. it it requires our students to achieve several industry level objectives, both in competencies and in performance. That's the class where they literally work on accounts. They literally are assigned accounts. They're literally visiting with the business community. Prior to this meeting, I had a meeting with interstate batteries. Um, the, the, the meeting was set up by an advanced student the level of the meeting was sufficiently high that the student and an, another student account manager and my corporate coordinator and myself were all on the call because they had two levels of management on the call. They had actually been able to secure a meeting with senior leadership at Interstate Batteries. And so we had a discussion about partnership between the University of Texas at Dallas and Interstate Batteries and to figure out how we can deepen our relationship with a company that's based here in Dallas. So hopefully that kind of answers that question. It's the class is called Advanced Sales. It's Marketing 4332, but within the program, we all call it whoever's teaching it and whoever's in it, that we know we're in something different than a class. Thank you very much. The next question that I have is you mentioned students receive a certification. What are the requirements outside of earning their degree in earning this certification? Great question. The, we belong to an alliance of other universities that have sales centers and it's called the University Sales Center Alliance. This is an alliance of, of approximately 65 to 70 universities around the country and they by virtue of that organization, they provide a nationally recognized certification. To be able to achieve that certification, students are, are to take 12 credit hours that are defined by the national body um, and perform 50 points of activities outside of the academic curriculum. If they complete those while as an undergrad, they can receive a USCA certification. And we were, we, we have about, I think, I think it'd be about 50 to 60 students a year who receive that national certification. And we have our own, the, the big gala event. We actually give out that certification and the parents come to that and we actually indicate where the student is heading for their employment. 
And that's actually the capstone of the evening is recognizing our graduating certification students. Now, Dr. Dover, for your November 6th event, do you plan to conduct it virtually or how have you modified it this year due to the pandemic? That's killing us. It's killing us. Um, so we actually had to move the last one to, we, we had the DJC set and the lockdown, obviously we, we had the protocols and the campus closed about what was it three weeks before the event started and luckily all of all of our um all of our presenters were experiencing covid just like us um, and they all pivoted their messaging to a covid world um, so this is virtual um, many of the many of the industry people are a little frustrated that we're unable to not do it live because one of the huge benefits of the Leadership Summit is collaboration in a, in a setting like the DJAC where really the side meetings are probably 50 to 80% of the value that people would get by being at that summit. But it is, it is virtual until we are allowed, just like anybody else. Um, the second we're allowed to move it back to a live event, we would do so because that is what the business community is asking us to do as soon as possible. But this one will be virtual. Thank you for answering that question. Another question in the queue um, is, what are characteristics that set successful graduates apart from struggling graduates? Desire. You know, it's, it, it's interesting. I'm of the belief that I, I really believe in the human potential. And so one of the things, even, even those of us that teach, you know, mathematics, statistics, hard science, engineering, um, maybe people would debate this with me. Um, I think everybody's capable of doing anything, but it could be more costly for some. Um, I, I can do math well, but it's costly for me. So I have completed very advanced mathematics, but I don't enjoy it. It's not intuitive to me and I wouldn't call it simple and easy. And, and so there, right. So the question really becomes, you know, how do you separate that student? And I really do think when they're so young, especially in the undergrad, it really does come down to, do we give them an environment in which they can incubate and find, they can find the desire to accomplish what they want? Um, this course and this program is extremely transformational to the student, or they hate it. So it's it, it really, you come out of it, the amount of work that we have the students do in that advanced course I had, a, I, I had a finance student in my office for a one-on-one -on -one, because we actually have one-on-one -on -one interviews with them on a monthly basis to make sure that the progress is appropriate for the course. And she expressed to me, she said, I just didn't anticipate this course trend changing me. And I said, well, we did. We designed it to be transformational. It, it really forces our students to combat their fears you know, I, I, I had one young student, we know we're in a very diverse culture, whose culture would be to not engage in a male authority figure uh, in a comfortable way. And we were discussing because in this project, she had to make calls to both males and females. It was her choice, but and we were able to have a conversation around that to say, okay, well, that meeting went well, the other meeting didn't go well. What do you think the difference was? And then it, we were able to process that opportunity to say, oh, that made you feel uncomfortable. And okay, so do you want to avoid that or do you want to adapt for it? And how do you want to adapt? Because you, it's okay, you can do it in a different way, but you need to think about this because you're going to be in other meetings and professional settings. How do you want to approach this? How do you want to think through this? How do you want to develop confidence in these moments? And so that's why it's transformational. 
I can put them in a mock setting and I can get their learning to a certain point. But when they have to have a meeting with the vice president of a sales organization one on one, that is a completely different setting. We do ask the students to, we use Zoom, um, sorry, Microsoft, but we had Zoom before everybody else went to Microsoft. And we have an AI engine that transcribes the meeting. And the students actually request, they, they indicate to the company, we do have, you know, I'm doing this for educational purposes. I do have an AI engine that's listening in and doing note taking for me so that I can get instruction on how my call went. And then we have the AI engine literally goes in and looks for how the call went, gave us indications of proper things that we're looking for and probably things where they need to improve upon. And so they also can go back and look at the AI reports and also look at their own calls and, and kind of think through, okay, I, got, I kind of got stuck there. We have a sales lab on campus that's that has people there between 40 and 50 hours a week. Um, obviously COVID modified, right? <laughs> so, but normally they can walk into that lab and the person at the lab is somebody who's already been through the boot camp, and they can sit down with them and say, okay, let's go over that video and let's, let's see what the challenge was. Um, they can come to office hours with TAs too, but the, the, the lab is open 40 to 50 hours a week for the students to go in and get assistance from their peers that have already done that. So hopefully that answers the question. I may have gone a long way around that one. Indeed, you answered it and thank you very much. Um, can you provide a little bit of insight as to what you believe the curriculum at UTD students or put students light years ahead of their peers? Can you provide an opinion or even foundational information related to well, I, that question? I think there's I think there's two elements we knew we were doing a while ago. So we've been doing it. Um, we've modeled our program at the University of Houston. So that's one of our first um, peer institutions. They have had our sales program for over 20 years. The other institution that within the state would be Baylor University. They've had a program for over 25 years. Um, I'm also very familiar. I, I did go to Chicago to one of the largest sales programs in the country, DePaul. And I also have spent some significant time at Florida State University. They host one of the national competitions. And that's also the host of the Sales Educators Academy that I participate in on an annual basis. And so um, we didn't develop the curriculum in a vacuum. So that's the first thing. Um, the, the USCA model we get together twice a year, we share curriculums, we challenge each other on a national basis, and then we compete head to head um, in about 15 to 20 competitions a year to see who is executing better. So that's the whole field elevates. So that's the first thing. When we take a sales student from any of the USCA schools, they're probably gonna outperform somebody who was not at a USCA school. Not always drive matters, but usually the curriculum difference. So the students know how to hold a meeting. I think where we make a difference are on the following areas. Number one, we actually do what Houston does and we actually have our students sell. There are very few programs in the country that are willing to let their students actually do outbound communication to real people. It's a risky enterprise. It is, um, it makes you pull your hair out. It makes you get gray hairs. I just had a call with my staff. We had three or four, oh my goshes, uh, in the last 48 hours. And, and so, you know, it's, it, it's very challenging, um, but it's such an amazing opportunity for the students to get over the hump of the fear of having those calls, having those meetings. I think the next piece, that I would say is that we have one of the only digital prospecting courses in the nation. Most other universities have a CRM course or they have a B business to business marketing course, but this course combines the CRM, prospecting, phone calling, and 
what's called sales stack. So in a modern sales world, you don't just have a CRM system, you have a baseline CRM system, and then you have what they call point solutions that stack on top of your CRM system. And so um, maybe I'm nuts, but I, 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 I I have developed relationships with many sales stack providers, with CEOs of companies, and we have been able to receive academic use of anywhere from a half a dozen to a dozen sales stack components. So what that means is when a student comes into our digital prospecting course, they're not only introduced to a CRM system and what it means, they're literally asked to generate data into a system. And then they're asked to use other tools within the stack to truly create a campaign that supports the bootcamp students and promotes different things that we're doing to the business community. And they actually are graded off of the success of their campaigns. So simply creating a campaign is not adequate. And we do it in, in and so, so I think that's element, element number one is live selling. Element number two is the digital prospect. And I already kind of gave away element number three, which is sales stack. We not only describe sales stack, but we have it, we talk about it, and we use it. And so then the third element kind of comes into play is that we also use an iterative design method of learning. So, and this is part of our redesign from three years ago. What we did is we had these quotas and we had these, these things that we had students do. We had projects, right? They had to get so many people to the sales leadership summit, or they had to get so many judges to one of our judging events or they had to get a certain amount of people to be a member of that supports our organization. And we, we waited to the end of the semester and gave them a grade on whether their performance was good or bad, right? Well, what we found is that 80% of students really kind of did bad because they'd wait till the end. So if you know failure is going to happen, can you bring the failure to the beginning of the semester and then iterate? Make, make the failure high enough that they'll care, but give the redemption enough that they can recover. I'm not saying I've perfected this by any means. Believe me, it's a living, breathing thing. So in one of the classes, we have five iterative cycles. They happen at two week intervals. We go into a market and we execute against a particular target. At the end of two weeks, we see what the results are like. 90% of students did not do what we asked them to do, did not learn. They simply got it done in time for it to be due. Have you read a paper? I think we've all read papers that look like they were just done before the deadline. In our world, that does not work. So what we have to do is, so we move that cycle up into the first 30 days. And 90% of students do not get the result because they didn't do what we taught them how to do. So rather than wait till the end of the semester to have that, let's bring that failure up front. Now we're not in the hard sciences, we're not in other areas, we get to do this. And so then we can say, okay, 10% of you had success and we do what's called huddles. So we actually cross pollinate and say, okay, tell us how you won, tell us how you lost. Lose, losses are equally valuable as wins. And so the students then go, oh, I have to work at this a little bit. Then we go into another iterative cycle for two to three weeks. And then we stop and we assess and we say, okay, now all well, 30% of you had a positive outcome, 70% of you still had a bad outcome. At this point, we can begin to talk very differently and say, Here's the challenge if we keep presenting how to do this and we add layers of complexity with each iteration, new modules, new material, right? And so we keep saying, well, if you haven't altered your behavior, I don't know that you're learning. 
So we have two or three more iterative cycles. By the end, in a non-COVID world, we were running 80 to 90% students with success factors. But if you went back to the 50, at the third or fourth iteration, we were at 60% failure. The grading comes at the end of the cycles. However, participation in each cycle is about 40% of their grade. So you can't ever let up. You have to keep learning in each iterative cycle. And so I think that one of the reasons that we've seen the exponential growth, when I interviewed those students who had those exponential performance components, realize I just told you the design of the curriculum. It's not like we tell them to think iteratively. Of the four interviews I had, all four of them, three of them without any prompting said, I'm constantly iterating on my performance. That was not our intent, right? We were trying to deliver an academic outcome through iterative design, but they carried the iterative design into the field and continued to iterate. I think that's one of the biggest reasons we've seen the exponential component. Thank you very much. And we have time for one more question. It is, how does the Center for Professional Sales keep their students abreast of all the new and innovative technology that keeps cropping up? Well, the first thing is you can't because it's, 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 it's happening at hundreds of new companies are being launched every single year in my space. So Sales Leadership Summit is really our opportunity to, to bring our alumni, ourselves, and our students as close to where we can. I do uh, head to Dreamforce annually, the Salesforce uh, Users Conference. I do go to the American Association of Inside Sales Professionals, the AISP's Leadership Summit on an annual basis. And that is where I see where at least the investors are spending enough money to have CEOs present at those conferences. And then I'll visit with a lot of executives and say, hey, what are you, what are you looking at? What should we be looking at? And we cross pollinate on what are the high impact technologies that we need to deploy into both out in the field. And if they're gonna, if our partners are gonna deploy it, then we probably want to introduce it in the curriculum so that our students get that edge. Thank you. And I do apologize. One other question snuck sure. into that queue. Business and sales can be a hard race that needs endurance. How do you teach students self-care and when to step back? Well, I think that's tough with Z's because they have no throttle. They don't throttle themselves. That's one of the discovery points is that, um, you know, the Z's will just keep going. If you give them, if you give them stuff they, they find valuable, they, they'll drive themselves um, without, you know, without self-care. And it's, that's been a tough adjustment. That's been something in the last year I've had to actually pull back because I noticed that they don't stop themselves. And so that's, millennials did, Z's don't. And so that's a, that's a challenge. Um, I don't think I have a good answer for that. I think that's part of um, my journey right now is to say that if, you know, if you are going to stay relevant, you are going to engage this, this, this current generation of students, if you truly engage them, they'll go all the way. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes that, that isn't good. And so I, I do think that's one of the challenges that we are now facing as educators in the undergrad space. And soon it's going to be a challenge um, in the graduate space. But I've done a few presentations even to industry and said, hey, you, you better be prepared because this group of Zs are not millennials. And you're right, they don't. Millennials were all about self. Z's are all about getting ahead and, and, and learning and, and earning and experiencing. And so it, it is a bit of a challenge. I don't think I have a great answer. I, I, I'm with whoever asked that question. I think it's a great question. And it's the challenge that we need to kind of work on and collectively as an institution. 
Thank you for sharing your time, talent, and resources with the attendees and community at large, Dr. Dover. Interested in attending this event? Registration and so much more can be found at research.utdallas.edu.